Okay, so in your readings, you came across a lot of this phrase here um, that randomized control trials are the gold standard of causal inference research. Um, and this is a very common thing that you see out in the world. Um, so as a quick review here that we've been talking about for the past few sessions here, um, there are different ways of researching things. You can have experimental studies and you can have observational studies. Experimental studies are based on random trials. Um, observational studies are based on just data that's collected. Um, however, like if you have some government agency that's collecting data on people, the census is an observational study. Um, basically, any data set that doesn't come from an experiment is an observational study. And so if you're trying to find causal effects, which one is better? Um, before you take this class, experimental studies is the only way to go. After you take this class, you'll realize that observational studies um, actually work for finding causal effects, but they have to be done well. If they're not done well um, and with specific strategies to isolate the pathway between treatment and outcome, then they'll be wildly biased and incorrect. Um, so I had you look at this um, article from the New York Times here, showing if world or if work phase, or the workplace wellness programs are effective in different outcomes, um, like the number of gym visits or um, hospital spending or participation in running events. And so what they did in this in this article here is they compared a whole bunch of studies that were done with observational data. Um, and a whole bunch of studies that were done with randomized controlled trials. And if you look in the middle here, that's the no effect line. And what they found is observational studies um, were, they had larger effects um, and fairly more biased. So if you just looked at an observational study, it looks like people who were enrolled in this well, wellness program participated a lot more in running events and had a lot more gym visits and didn't quit their jobs and decrease their hospital spending, a whole bunch of other things. These are big effects. But if this wellness program was randomly assigned, notice how the effects basically disappear. Everything is basically around zero. Ending employment is kind of closer to this side. Um, maybe there's an effect there, um, but everything else is just kind of generally around um, nothing. Um, because there's a lot of self-selection in observational studies. If you're measuring particip participation in running events, people who are at the running events probably care about their health and probably willingly enrolled in the employer wellness program or employee wellness program and did other things to kind of improve their health because they care. Um, and so, of course, you'll see a huge effect in an observational study of people at marathons. Um, so... For this reason, you'll often see this thing here. If you Google RCT gold standard, you'll find more than half a million results. Um, there are a whole bunch of different um, articles. This is from your World Bank textbook here. People love the gold standard of causal influence. Um, even the Nobel Prize people do. Um, in uh, 2019, um, the Nobel Prize in economics was given to um, Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee, who um, founded JPAL, which is the Jamil Poverty Action Lab at MIT. Um, and what they do is they run randomized control trials all around the world to measure the effects of specific programs on poverty. Um, at the end of this class, you can apply to intern internships and jobs at JPAL. I've had past students um, apply to specific fellowships and stuff because of the training you have here, um, because they care about causal inference in international development. And they got the, the Nobel Prize as a result of all of the work that they've done. Um, if you go to their website, you can actually download all of their studies that they've done. You can find all of the different causal effects that they found with specific programs. And it, it's really cool stuff. You should, you should check them out. And so randomized control trials are great. Um, we like them. They are a gold standard. We love seeing research that come from RCTs. The issue, though, is that they're super impractical to do all the time. Um, not just impractical, sometimes impossible, sometimes unethical. Um, and so you can't throw an RCT at every possible program that you can think of or every policy you think of. Um, and so the other issue is saying that it is the gold standard um, kind of automatically implies that any causal inference you get out of an RCT will be true if you do the experiment right. Um, but that is not true. Um, you could do an RCT incorrectly. Um, you could do like you could have issues with external validity. And so even though you have true causal effects for a specific subset of the population, you have no idea if that actually scales up to the rest of the world. 
Um, so ultimately, we don't actually care if studies are experimental or not. Um, all we really care about is whether or not our causal inferences are valid. Whether that validity comes from randomized control trials or observational studies doesn't matter as long as it's valid. Um, when you did your um, validity assignment, the whole purpose of doing that was to see some of those studies were randomized control trials, some were not, but they all had fairly high levels of validity, both internally and externally, because they were done well. Um, and all four of those studies have credible causal effects, even though not all of them were experiments. Um, so that's ultimately what we care about, is not that an RCT somehow magically endows a, an effect as purely causal. Um, all we really care about is whether or not the causal inferences we get are valid. RCTs help with that because when you think about a DAG, all of the arrows are getting deleted, all the confounding is gone, that's cool. Um, you have to deal with a whole bunch of confounders if you deal with observational data. Um, but you can still find valid causal inference. Um, one reason why this gold standard idea might be helpful is that it's a helpful baseline or a rubric for thinking about other methods. And we'll be doing this as we think about the different STATSI models that we'll be looking at for the rest of the semester. Um, for matching, for instance, when we when we look at matching in the next section here, um, the language we use is we're basically kind of faking a control group. And so we have people who are treated, and we want to find people who are similar to them, who are untreated, and we can kind of simulate a control group. When we talk about difference and differences models, we're also kind of faking a control group. When we talk about um, regression discontinuity, we're also trying to simulate a control group. And so for all of these models, all of these ways of addressing observational data, we're still using the language of RCTs because it's a good baseline for kind of measuring causal effects with the treatment and control group. Um, but ultimately, this whole gold standard label is not kind of perfect. Um, RCTs can be uh, poorly done. Um, their results aren't necessarily true. Um, and so don't don't over rely on the fact that something is an RCT for causation. Um, for instance, I had you listen to this podcast about the Moving to Opportunity program. And this was a really cool program. It's been a really long running randomized control trial. Um, it was started in the 70s trying to answer a specific question about um, you know, what are the causes of poverty. And the main question here was, does the neighborhood you grow up in or live in influence your economic outcomes? Um, does this influence poverty ultimately? Um, and so they want the researchers wanted to measure the effect of neighborhoods. And the only way to do that was to randomly assign people to specific neighborhoods, which seems really tricky. You're basically telling people where they can live. They sign up for this program, and then they're just kind of getting into a lottery of where they might possibly live. Um, so as you heard in the podcast, um, people who uh, were signed up for this program had, um, they were low income people with um, Section 8 housing vouchers. Um, and so they were randomly assigned to three different groups. Um, one group had to stay in their current housing situation. One group could move to anywhere else that would accept a Section 8 housing voucher. And then the third group had to move somewhere that had less than 10% of, of, of poverty in the neighborhood. And then they also got relocation counseling and assistance to move. Um, as you heard in the podcast, most people actually wanted option number two. Um, to be able to use the housing voucher in any place that accepted um, vouchers. They didn't want option three um, because it is uncomfortable to move to a, neighbor, to a new neighborhood and to kind of uproot yourself and lose your social um, support networks. So people didn't really want to do that um, because that's hard. Plus, you're moving into neighborhoods where you don't necessarily fit in. Um, if you're moving into super rich neighborhoods, that's going to be like awkward feeling and people didn't want to do that. So, as a result of this trial that they've been doing for years, um, as you heard in the podcast, there's been lots of different effects from this. Um, the direct effects on the people who moved, like the adults who moved, there weren't too many effects. It didn't kind of increase earnings, it didn't increase education, it didn't increase life expectancy or health or anything like that. Um, it did improve outcomes for children as long as they were under, um, I think it was 18 or 16, can't remember from the podcast, some number like that. So if you were a little kid when your family got lotteried in to move to a, a richer neighborhood, um, then you had much better outcomes than people who were in the control group. Um, but if you were older, 
um, you didn't. And so researchers hypothesize that that's because of social networks, um, because you're fairly stable in your social networks when you're an older teenager than you are when you're four. Um, and so as a result, the social networks and kind of social connections really do influence kind of your, your greater economic outcomes. Um, and all of that was able, they found that because of randomized control trials, which is a really cool thing that they did here. Um, but it's full of other issues because it's kind of a small um, segment of the population. This wasn't a national um, randomized control trial. And yay, we have a causal effect, but the policy implications of this are what? Um, move everybody to richer neighborhoods? Move richer people to poorer neighborhoods? Shuffle people around? That's really hard when everybody can kind of choose where they want to live. Um, and so the generalizability of this is really tricky. Like it's a cool finding, but what next? I don't know. So these RCTs are great um, because they fix all sorts of internal validity issues. Um, the moving to opportunity findings are sound. Um, they're very believable because it was randomly assigned and there's a whole, like nobody self-selected into these groups. Um, so RCTs are great at selection issues. Um, because they get rid of the self-selection effects. And they're also really good, good at fixing these trend issues that we talked about in the threats to validity section. Um, maturation will happen in both treatment and control groups. Any secular trends or seasonality will also happen to both treatment and control groups. Um, regression to the mean, where people who are unlucky um, in the extreme will eventually just get back to normal levels of luck, or who are extra lucky, they'll come back down to normal levels of luck. Um, that unluckiness is also equally distributed across treatment and control groups. They all just kind of average out, um, which is great because then you don't have to worry about these threats to validity. But RCTs do not fix attrition, which is people dropping out of a study. They are actually, this is kind of the worst threat to internal validity for randomized control trials um, because often people will get assigned to a treatment group or a control group and then not want to do it. And then they'll leave the study. And then, oh no, your results are messed up. Um, and so if attrition is correlated with the treatment, then that's gonna be bad. Um, so people might drop out because, they, because the treatment is scary, they don't like it, um, or it has negative effects. Um, if you think about medicine, for instance, if somebody's selected for the treatment wing of some new medicine and it makes them sick and they just stop taking it, that's going to ruin the, the results of the study later because um, they dropped out of the study because of the negative side effects. Um, or they could drop out because they got into or they didn't get into, into the control group. And so that's tricky. You don't have any data on them. Um, and if there's something that is correlated with treatment, it's not just people in both groups kind of randomly dropping out. That would be great if everybody just kind of randomly decided to drop out. But if there are systematic reasons for people dropping out, then your whole results are going to be wrong and biased. Um, so how do you fix this? With randomized controlled trials, you need to recruit as effectively as possible. You don't want just one segment of the population, especially if there are things that might cause people to, uh, to leave the study. Um, you want a diverse segment of the population. You don't want these weird participants, the Western educated from industrialized countries um, and the other two acronym letters um, where um, like these are just kind of rich, oh yeah, rich and democratic countries. These are like, you don't want only Harvard undergrads in your RCT because um, the results are not gonna be generalizable. And um, if something makes it so that they don't wanna be in the treatment, then all of, like, if there's something systematic um, with these young undergrads who are at Harvard, um, then they're all gonna drop out because something's gonna cause that. So you want kind of a wider swath of the population to be able to, to avoid attrition. Um, you want to get people on board. If, you, if they know that it's a randomized control trial, you want to kind of get them pumped up for science and say, you need to care about this. You need to focus and, and report back whenever um, the, the researchers come by. Um, we're doing this for the sake of science. There's lots of benefits that can come from this. Um, if you've ever done an institutional review board um, application where you get ethical approval um, from a university for doing a study, you often are supposed to kind of divulge the benefits of 
participating in the research to the participants so that they can know that they're doing something useful. Um, if people don't know they're doing something useful, they'll be more likely to drop out and then you have attrition issues. Um, and then finally, you want to generally collect as much baseline information as possible um, so that you can check for randomization of attrition. If you only collect like pre-treatment income, um, you can see if there's an effect between leaving the program and income, but maybe there's no effect there. Maybe it's only people who um, are only high school graduates and not college graduates. And so there's something systematic with high school graduates that is making them leave the program. If you don't collect that column, you're not going to be able to see that. And so getting as much information about these participants beforehand um, will let you then go back after the program is done to see if there's any patterns in why people left, um, which is why when we looked at the previous section, we talked about checking balance. These are the things that you're going to be checking for balance. Um, you want to make sure you can see if there's any systematic reasons using this stuff here. Um, you can also have randomization failures. This is the same idea as checking baseline characteristics, making, it sure, making sure that people who are randomly assigned um, kind of, or treatment and control groups have roughly the same um, composition um, with all of the different confounders and other demographic variables that influence both. Um, you also have issues with non-compliance. Um, this is related to attrition, but this is kind of willful um, non-compliance here. Some people who are assigned the treatment won't take it, um, but they'll still stay in the study, so it's not quite attrition. Some people assigned to control will take it. Um, and so they'll actively seek out something. This is harder with like medical trials if you're trying to, to test a new form of Tylenol and they don't know if they have a sugar pill or whatever. Um, you're not going to see non-compliance there, um, this part. But if somebody knows that kind of somebody down the street has the treatment, they could go get the treatment from them and, and that's going to mess stuff up. Um, so as a result, we'll see these later when we talk about um, instrumental variables and... Um, regression discontinuity and other forms of, of observational causal inference type of regressions. Um, but like we were measuring with the average treatment effect and the average treatment on the treated, um, another form of these is something called the intent to treat effect, which is kind of the effect of being assigned to the treatment group or the control group. It's not the effect of actually taking the treatment because you might have non-compliance. And so often you can actually measure just the intent to treat which is just um, assignment. It's not always going to be the best result, um, but it, it's something more accurate. Like um, people aren't going to comply with this or aren't going to not comply with the assignment. Um, they just get that like in the mail or however you assign treatment or assign being in the treatment group or in the control group. They have that physical assignment and you can measure that instead of whether or not they do the program. Um, and so it's a different form of causal effect that you can find. Um, some other limitations, randomized control trials don't magically fix other forms of validity. Um, construct validity, which is, does your measure actually capture what you're trying to measure? Um, that even if you have a, ran a randomized control trial, you might not be measuring the thing that you care about. Um, so moving to opportunity, their main question was, um, they were talking about like poor neighborhoods. Um, but really, they were most interested in race, um, and it was in the context of the civil rights movement, and they wanted to see if they could get poor black neighborhoods specifically to have better economic outcomes. But it is illegal to tell people that they can that you can only move to a white neighborhood and you're targeting only black people moving to white neighborhoods. Um, you can't do that. And so what they did is they used income as a proxy. Um, so the original issue was race, but they instead looked at income, which could work as a proxy, but this is also an example of that streetlight effect that we talked about in session six, um, where the streetlight exists, they have data that they can legally use on income, so they use that even though their question is further down the road in the dark, they can't actually access it, and so you have to make sure this construct validity is good. Um, statistical conclusion validity has to be done well. Um, if you do the stats wrong on an RCT, then you can't suddenly say, but it was an RCT, gold standard, ha. Huh? Um, it can still be wrong. Um, RCTs also definitely don't fix external validity. This is one of their biggest criticisms, is that they're good at finding small-scale localized effects 
um, in specific situations, but then scaling that up to a general population is where things start falling apart. Um, so in 2019, after Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee got the Nobel Prize, there were lots of criticisms of their work, um, specifically saying that um, they only focus on small scale questions. Um, so one of their experiments was do wristbands increase vaccination rates um, or do specific textbooks improve school performance? And so what they're doing in j is focusing on very small slices of the larger poverty question um, and measuring those small slices very well. Um, but then these critics are saying, who cares about these small slices when poverty is this huge thing? Um, how do you know if you do this mosquito net trial in a village in Kenya, if that's going to scale up to the rest of the world and fix malaria? Um, their response is, we don't know and we need more data for it. And that's why j exists. And so that they keep rolling out more and more randomized control trials to kind of build up a bigger body of evidence that can then be used for generalizability. Um, so that's like, it is a known limitation of this. Um, it's just a very narrow band of something that you're studying. Um, so some issues about when you're supposed to do this, um, because as we said, you can't always do it. Um, it might be costly, it might be unethical, it might be impossible. Um, but there are some situations where it is okay to do this that kind of meet ethical standards. Um, if the demand for the treatment exceeds the supply, then it's okay to randomly assign um, because you have a, uh, you don't have enough to give to people. And so you can kind of do a lottery system and, and make a fair way of distributing the thing that you care about. Um, we saw this in Oregon. Um, with the expansion of Medicaid, they had extra money to expand Medicaid to an even higher level of, of people at the poverty line, but not enough. And so they randomly assigned people to get extra Medicaid and then have been studying them for the sake of science and RCTs. Um, but they could do that because um, they didn't have enough supply of the thing. Um, if treatment is going to be phased in over time and everybody's eventually going to get it, um, then it's okay to kind of randomly assign that. If it's something like a medical trial um, for a drug that only like a few people are ever going to get um, and it's not going to be phased in nationally, then it gets trickier, especially when people could benefit directly from a medical trial. Or if you know you have some magic fix to poverty um, and it's not going to be rolled out to everybody, then there's ethical questions about like, should people, should people be denied access to something that's going to fix their lives? Um, and that's where it gets tricky. Um, and so one uh, standard for figuring that out is this idea of equipoise. If treatment is an equipoise, then it's okay to randomly assign. This is the idea that you as a researcher genu genuinely don't know if the treatment is going to work. Um, if you know it's going to work um, and you know there's going to be huge positive effects, then it's kind of unethical to withhold those huge positive effects from people. Or if you know that doing the program is going to have huge negative effects, that's not an equipoise anymore. So if you wanted to run a randomized controlled trial on smokers um, to see if smoking causes lung cancer, you would have to randomly assign a whole bunch of people to smoke for 40 years and then track them. But we know at this point that doing that is going to kill people. Um, and we don't have genuine uncertainty anymore. And so we're beyond the point of being able to assign people randomly to smoking and non-smoking conditions. And so this is a good ethical thing to think about is, um, is this going to hurt people? And we know it's going to, and we know there are no benefits, or we know there are huge benefits and we're withholding um, changing people's lives for the sake of science. We don't want to do that. Um, you also want to randomly assign if local culture is open to randomization. This is something that j has run into in lots of different contexts that it's been working in, is that sometimes people don't like random assignment of, of things, especially if it's like wealth. Um, if you go into some village somewhere and give half of the households like $10,000 and the other half zero, that's going to cause all sorts of um, conflict. And um, often they found that the people will just like divide up the money they got with the people in the control group for the sake of like fairness and justice. And then that ruins the experiment. Um, and so you, you can't do that. It depends on, on the people that you're working with and the population you're working with. If you're a non-democratic monopolist, meaning um, basically if you're in charge of the thing and nobody has a say in it, um, 
This mostly works for like the private sector. If you're Amazon, you can do any RCT you want because you have total control over um, your offerings. Um, you see this all the time on Amazon specifically in most big websites. Um, you probably notice that sometimes when you look at an Amazon listing, the colors are slightly different or the layout is a little bit different or the buy button is, is higher or the picture is bigger or the price is smaller or something. Um, they constantly tinker with their websites um, they call it A-B testing, um, where they put some people in group A and some people in group B, and then they measure the outcomes in group A and B and see which one causes kind of a bigger effect. Um, and they can do that because they have total control over the website, and we have no say in what they're doing in their website. Um, and so if you're in a situation like that, cool, um, do it. Um, nonprofits can do this too. If you have like a, an email campaign, um, you can do A-B testing and have um, one color of donation button go to some to a random portion of your, of your donors and have another color of your donation button go to an email to your other half of your donors and see which one causes more donations. Um, maybe one color kind of triggers a, a, a bigger giving level. Um, you can do that because you're a non-democratic monopolist in that situation and it's, it's legal ethically to do that. Um, you can randomly assign if people don't know and it's ethical. Um, this is kind of getting into murkier, tricky um, territory here because you generally want to divulge when people are in a study so they know they're being studied. Um, but if, if they have no way of knowing, um, then it's sometimes okay. Um, but that's a very tricky situation. There's a whole bunch of ethical books and readings in the World Bank reading that you saw um, that talk about this. So that's tricky. And then finally, if a lottery is going to happen anyway, then you can jump on board um, because the people running that lottery have, have decided to, to randomize. And so you can kind of um, go along for the ride. That's what happened with the Oregon Medicaid study. Um, is Oregon was going to do the lottery anyway. And so um, researchers said, hey, we want in on this. And so they got it. Um, when to not randomly assign. If you need immediate results, don't do an RCT. Um, this takes a while to do. Um, it takes a while to, to plan the study, to implement the study, to collect the data, and then to analyze it. And it can take months and years. Um, if it's unethical or illegal, don't do it, obviously. Um, and sometimes it, we forget this. Um, and there's often lots of economic studies that come out and that are released, especially if you follow econ Twitter, um, hashtag econ Twitter, um, people release different studies and preprints and, and working papers. And often you'll see things that seem really ethically ambiguous um, and like verging on illegal and, and awful um, because like we love RCDs. And so we'll just randomly assign people to do all sorts of weird things. Um, so don't do illegal things. Um, if you're trying to measure something that's happened in the past, like you want to see the effects of city segregation in the 1950s on um, income today, you can't randomly assign that, obviously. That's already been done. Um, if it's um, something that's a universal ongoing phenomena, um, something bigger. Um, so if you want to measure the, uh, you can't do an RCT for climate change, for instance. Um, you can't do an RCT on democracy. Um, there are other ways of measuring the causal effects of things on climate change, but you can't do it with, with random trials because you don't have control over that. So don't try to randomly assign people um, because if you do, especially with kind of these types of things, then it gets into illegal land. Um, if you want to measure the effect of climate change on um, poverty along the, the seaboard um, and re or, uh, real estate prices, you would have to randomly assign people to live in like hurricane zones and wait for them to be hit by hurricanes. And that's like weirdly unethical and impractical and, and don't do that. Um, so again, if you're in any of these worlds here, don't think about RCTs. Um, so RCTs are great. Um, we would love to use them all the time. They're the gold standard, but not actually a gold standard. Um, and given all the limitations we have and how narrow of an effect they often find, um, there are other ways that we can um, look for causal effects using observational data instead of experimental data. And that's what we'll be focusing on for the rest of the semester.